It's my privilege to welcome you to uh, this installment of our Scripture and Ministry series. We're pleased today to have the Reverend Dr. Craig G. Bartholomew with us. I'll say a word about of introduction and then uh, offer a word of prayer for our time together. Um, he will then give us a lecture and we'll follow that with question and answer. So uh, we'll have uh, should have a good time of question available for question and answer afterwards. If you could uh, find your way for the question and answers, we have two microphones set up. If you could find your way to those and sort of form a queue, I'll help um, help moderate that so that way we're able to catch those for for the people who are watching online so they can hear the questions as well. The Reverend Dr. Craig G. Bartholomew is the director of the Kirby Lang Institute for Christian Ethics at Tyndale House, Cambridge. Formerly, he was senior research fellow at the University of Gloucestershire and recently the H. Evan Runner Professor of Philosophy and Professor of Religion and Theology at Redeemer University College. He's also adjunct faculty member at Trinity College Bristol and an Anglican priest. His academic background is in Old Testament studies and hermeneutics. He's also published widely across other fields, including in philosophy and cultural studies. He's edited and written many books, most recently Beyond the Modern Age, an archaeology of contemporary culture, which he co-authored with the Dutch economist Bob Goodsward, and Contours of the Kuyperian Tradition, a systematic introduction. As you can tell, he's a person of wide interest and deep talent, and we're pleased to have him with us today. Let me uh, pray for us and then ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Bartholomew. Lord, we give you thanks for this time together, for this opportunity to reflect upon uh, the goodness of your creation and indeed the goodness of the Creator. We pray that we will come to a deeper understanding and greater appreciation of that. We pray that you will bless our time together. And give us clarity of mind and charity of spirit, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Bartholomew? Uh, thank you very much, and it's wonderful to be here with you. This is my first uh, visit to TED's, so uh, it's exciting and been wonderful to meet uh, old friends and make new friends and so on. Uh, you can all hear me adequately, right? Okay, the soft English voice from across the ocean. So the topic of my lecture today is the goodness of creation and its ethical implications. A legacy of Neoplatonism and Christianity is the perennial temptation to doubt the goodness of creation. The gravitational pull, if I can put it that way, of Platonism is upwards and away from the visceral, earthy, textured materiality of the creation. Now let me uh, say immediately that there is a legitimate and indispensable vertical orientation to human life, since the doctrine of creation clearly articulates a two realms, not a two kingdoms, but a two realms theology of heaven and earth, with earth as the abode of God. It is not for nothing that Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven. And it is this legitimate vertical dimension that has always made Platonism seem so compatible with Christianity. And indeed, an important insight of Platonism is that to understand this world, we need a reference point, an anchor, outside of the earthly concrete world in order to understand it. But in the process, Platonism denigrates this world, uh, amongst other things, making the body the prison of the soul. Whereas, while biblical Christianity, as I understand it, and I'm right, of course, no, we, can, we can talk about that, 
refuses to deify this world and makes it utterly subordinate to God and his created abode in heaven. But nevertheless, we uh, take great delight in confessing that although it is not God, it is God's handiwork. And I love this Old Testament reference to the fact that heaven is God's throne and earth is his footstool. But oh my goodness, what dignity and glory to be the footstool of the living God. Now, the goodness of creation and its ethical implications, I guess it's only someone like me who would think of such a silly, wide-ranging topic for a lecture. And I remind you that the doctrine of creation is complex. A colleague and I have just finished a large doctrine of creation, which I hope will be published next year. But as large as ours is, it pales into insignificance against Karl Barth's four volumes on the doctrine of creation. But you know, that tells me that the doctrine of creation is complex. It's not a simple entity, and we need to bear in mind that complexity. And so the focus for my lecture today will simply be a text that I think we need to retrieve because it's under attack, I think, by by lots of theologians and biblical scholars, and that is Genesis 1.1 to 2.3. So first of all, tov, this wonderful Hebrew word tov in Genesis 1.1 to 2.3. Now, in my opinion, Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 is a carefully crafted, complex, literary text, okay? And by the way, literary doesn't mean untrue. What literary gets at is how this text is true. And I think that's often a mistake evangelicals have made, to think it's only certain types of text that can be true. But poetry can be true. In a profound way, a novel can be profoundly true. And so, you know, I want to alert you to the genre of Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. It's a carefully crafted, in my opinion, complex literary text. And I draw your attention to several aspects of how Tov functions in this opening, exquisite, mind-blowing, take off your feet because you're standing on holy ground, opening salvo of the great biblical meta-narrative. Now, first of all, the goodness of the whole of creation is clearly enunciated in Genesis 1 to 2, 3, with its repeated, this extraordinarily interesting phrase, the approval formula, and God saw, he told, that it was good. As is well known, creation by word or fiat is central to Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. What is not so commonly noted is that we find a pattern in this text, not just of creation by word, and God said, let there be, but also woven into that a creation, now by is probably the wrong preposition, but I'll use it anyway, I'll put it in inverted commas, or as Jacques Derrida would say, I will place it under erasure, so you then have no idea what I mean by it, but uh, also of sight. This is creation by word and of sight. So with the, and God said, let, let it be, which we're so aware of, this creation by word, you also get this, uh, this emphasis on vision and of sight, and God saw that it was good. Uh, The first such approval formula occurs in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 4, and intriguingly, overall, this formula occurs seven times in chapter 1, culminating in the tov ma'ot of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. Now, you know, uh, uh, this is like uh, uh, so in your face that if you don't get it, you, you need to be thoroughly defamiliarized with Scripture and read it afresh again. Because the sevenfold occurrence, the culmination, I mean, it is God, this majestic king who is saying, you know, looking and saying, 
Kitov, 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 Tov Maot. I mean, how could you not get it? That this alerts us unequivocally to the goodness of the parts and the whole of God's creation, which is summed up in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 in the merism heaven and earth. And you know what I mean by that. The way you refer to the totality of something is to refer to the extremities. Heaven and earth is a way of saying, and the whole is very good. Now, the Jewish uh, scholar E.M. Good captures something of the force of the repetition of the approval formula seven times when he writes in his own inimitable way. And this is why I quite like him and reading him. Now, you know that the name for God in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 is Elohim. It switches to Yahweh Elohim, which is very significant in chapters 2 and 3, a very unusual juxtaposition of those two names. But Good says this, Elohim is seldom an exaggerator. But I think this is a remarkably understated sentence. He's referring to Tov Ma'ot. When you consider the extent of what Elohim has done in a very short time, and I think it is worthwhile to repeat that the meaning of this Hebrew word tov, good, carries a connotation not merely of general excellence or of moral excellence, but also of beauty. And you know, I, I, I'm not trying to suggest this text doesn't teach us very important cognitive things about creation, but there is far more going on in this text than mere doctrinal, in a narrow sense, cognitive stuff. Kiel and Schroer note that the approval formula and its repetition is reminiscent of hymns. So I think we need to recapture something of this. I mean, th this is holy ground. This is sacred ground. And I think evangelicals, not only have we insisted on bringing our 21st century questions as the first port of call to this text, but in the process we have denatured it and we have lost the sense of extraordinary wonder and awe. And so this is hymnic. And one of the effects of this text should be, let us worship. So Kiel and Truer say that, and they also comment, and I love this, whenever it is God who says that something is good, it is similar to a superlative. You know, tov tovim, something like that. I mean, it's God who's saying that it's good. Thus, the approval formula is important theologically, developed in the narrative of Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 for particular reasons, and we need to attend to these. I don't find, when I read doctrines of creation, a lot of attention to the approval formula. And so, secondly, the approval formula is part of creation, part of God's activity of creation. Uh, Klaus Westermann says in his commentary on Genesis, that, and God saw that it was good, is part of the structure of the narrative and is telling us that such recognition, now listen to this, belongs to the very process of creation. So very interesting. You know, who of us, when we think of creation, have thought that the approval formula is a constitutive part of the process of creation? And then uh, one of my favorite theologians, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Rightly, if you look at his creation and fall, which was his first great exercise in theological interpretation, and I, I love Bart, uh, you know, his Roma brief, and Bonhoeffer doing this work, neither the theologians nor the biblical scholars knew what to do with this work, because it didn't fit with any of the genres that their academic contexts were familiar with. And they are the predecessors of what is called now theological interpretation, which in my uh, simple language is simply reading the text to hear God's address. And I would hope that all of you would say amen. You're allowed to, are you, at, at TED's <laughs> on an issue like that? So in his, in his creation and fall, Bonhoeffer follows his chapter on the word with God's look. It's so very perceptive. Doctrine of creation, the word. But there's also God's look. 
And so, you know, th this, I think, is theologically very fertile stuff. We have creation by word. And then woven into that is we have the notion of gaze. I think, and God saw, I would like to think, and, and the ancient Near Eastern scholars can uh, rugby tackle me verbally on this, and, and they're most welcome to. I think God saw is something akin to, and God contemplated. I don't think it's our, oh, 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 I saw you in the supermarket yesterday. I think this is much more an attentive, contemplative uh, gaze. So creation by word, and then creation with gaze. Thirdly, clearly the approval formula contains anthropomorphic language. God is portrayed here as a God who sees. Now, you know, from Daniel chapter 5 and verse 23, which I, uh, this text has got me very excited, we learn that God's seeing is an activity that makes him distinctive from the other gods who are not gods. This wonderful verse, you have praised the gods of silver and, uh, and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. Okay, but the God in whose power is your very breath. Now, you see, here I think we've got an intertextual allusion to Genesis 2. The doctrine of creation is so foundational, it's woven often in very deep and unrecognized ways through the fabric of Scripture. It's the opening salvo of the grand drama of Scripture and therefore is the backdrop to every other act. And we will misunderstand the other acts if we don't get that first act right, whose power is your very breath and to whom belong all your ways you have not honored. Seeing, hearing, and knowing are peculiarly predicates of the living God. And this brings us on to the contested terrain of the nature of religious language or language about God, about which a, a, an enormous amount has been written. Uh, here, I just refer to Brown, Brian Howell's monograph, In the Eyes of God, a Metaphorical Approach to Biblical Anthropomorphic Language. And Howell seeks to develop an appropriate metaphorical view of language about God, and focus in particular, and focuses in particular on God as seeing. He explores the variety of contemporary and ancient approaches to religious language or, or how we can speak about God, and he, he concludes, in sum, biblical anthropomorphisms are metaphorical, but not strictly derived from the human arena. Because humans are created as the image of God, there is an ontological basis for their descriptors to refer and refer accurately to God. They describe God in a supernatural sense of these terms, and yet one in which humans have potential to access. Thus, it is misleading to speak of these attributes and actions as drawn from the human realm and somehow naively projected onto God. Rather, the concepts originally understood from their employment in the human realm are applied to God metaphorically in such a way as to point to the divine attribute or action without fully defining it. Their meaning is then further delineated according to its contextualized usage or sampling, he references recur. This then becomes paradigmatic for human behavior in that context and sheds new light on how human behavior is then seen. Now, uh, you can ask me about this in question time, but you know, religious language and language about God, there's long historical and contemporary debates in this area. What I do find insightful about Howell's approach are the following four points. It recognizes the ontological or creational basis for such language. Now, and you know, this is something I'm going to come on to, but uh, in my opinion, in philosophy and theology and any other discipline, Everything is transformed when you say to yourself, I'm exploring this as part of my father's good creation. Now, I do not understand how you can do philosophy or theology or any other discipline 
without that transforming the discipline. So this recognizes that. It also recognizes that such language refers or points to God's action. As such, thirdly, it leaves open the precision. So one might be able to point truly to God without being able to say precisely how God sees, but while holding on to the fact that it is true to say that God does see. And so, <clears throat> fourthly, it affirms the accuracy of such metaphorical language. Now, I've been doing a lot of work on uh, classical theism and, uh, and other things, but uh, what I do find here very helpful is that being made in the likeness of God, I think we should expect human language about God to be anthropomorphic. So this is not some strange projection onto that which can never be truly known. But as Colin Gunton and other, uh, Eleanor Stump and others have noted, as if we are made in the likeness of God, and this is God's creation, then biblical anthropomorphism is exactly what we would expect. And we should not think that such language is smoke without fire, as it were. It is smoke with the tsunami of tsunamis of fire. It's the living God, and it's truthful reference to the living God. So Howell brings his approach to bear on Genesis 1 and concludes that we find there that God sees objects and states of affairs. We are not told how God sees, but that he sees is stressed through repetition of the approval formula. Now, this is what is so interesting with where Howell gets to with this. What the approval formula does, it, it provides us, and this is the whole point, I think, of the approval formula, with a look at the creation through the eyes of God. I think rhetorically that's what's going on in this literature. You know, why would we be told that God looks and he sees and he declares that he told? And Hal is saying one of the things, and this is very important for me, is that it's alerting us to the possibility of a God's eye perspective on the world and what happens when we look at the creation through the eyes of God. Hal says, God's seeing is a separate act from his naming, blessing, or creating and involves God's engagement with his creation through evaluating it and enjoying it. This has the effect of establishing that creation, as it was made in part and in total, innately reflects the goodness of God in his creativity. God's seeing differs from that of humans in its cosmic scope, but the seeing of God and humans overlaps in its engagement with, its affirmation of, and its enjoyment of the creation. And so again, we see the importance of attending to God's seeing in our doctrine of creation. Now, what do the commentaries have to say about this? <laughs> okay. You know, it's a bit like Monty Python, and now for something completely different. <laughs> okay, and, and you know, I uh, love commentaries, but I just wish we could um, uh, remarry, you know, uh, or, or reconcile theology and commentary. I mean, is, isn't the aim of exegesis to help us to hear what God is saying to us today? And doesn't this kind of rich theology, shouldn't we find it in there? Well, alas, not always. Anyway, I mean, there's some great, great commentaries on Genesis. One of my favorites is that of my former colleague, Gordon Wenham. And he compares the approval formula with its related formula, such as God's dividing finding these elements flexible in their order. He also compares this to an artist's admiration of his work, emphasizing the aesthetic qualities of what God sees. Westerman highlights the idea that God's sight acknowledges the value of the work. He says the procedure itself is quite clear. A craftsman has completed a work. He looks at it and finds that it is a success or judges that it is good. The Hebrew sentence includes the finding or judging in the act of looking. Furthermore, uh, uh, Westerman says, the light is good simply because God regards it as good. The light and its goodness cannot be separated from God's attentive regard. And he argues that while tov has multiple meanings, 
Every one in Genesis 1 is colored by the functional sense of being good for something. Seeing for Westerman is a metaphor for a value judgment, and this is where I do find uh, Westerman very helpful, that further functions as a catalyst for the response of the creation to the creator. Westerman notes that the refrain of God seeing functions as a link to the praise of God. God's regard, which recognizes that what he has done is good, provides here the clearest link between the account of, of, of creation and the praise of the creator. The praise of the creator is a continuation of the recognition by the creator. Thus, God's creation of the world and subsequent seeing of it as good establishes an initial pattern of good works followed by praise, which later his people, and then ultimately the totality of the creation, become an echo and a grand symphony saying, Kitov, Kitov. For John Hartley, the approval formula makes a qualitative judgment about God created. Tob in Genesis 1, he says, is a loaded term carrying four implications. Uh, first of all, they're about function. So this is Westerman's what it being for. Secondly, that which has just been created contributed to the well-being of the created order. Thirdly, the new creation has aesthetic qualities. Fourthly, it has moral force advancing righteousness on the earth. Now, you know, uh, 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 well, I think my response to all of this is thank you, and this is very helpful. So I find I learn a lot. Do you know what I find missing, if I may say so, is that too many biblical scholars, I think, lack a philosophy and a theology of language. And then the default mode is to try and give a logically tight definition of tov. Now, if you know something about philosophy of language, I had the privilege of teaching such a course for years at Redeemer University College, so I've learned a bit about this, then I would argue that tovia, in terms of linguistics, functions as something like a multivocal symbol. In other words, it's a bit like, you know, I've also worked on, uh, on Ecclesiastes. You know, what does hevel mean? Well, it's just not, you know, and the default mode and a kind of positivism in biblical studies is you've got to get the logical definition of one meaning. It's just not how literature works. You know, when you see something that is just out of this world, the most magnificent piece of art, or you go and hear the best music concert you, you've ever heard, and someone says to you, how was it? And you just say, it was just tov. Do you see what I mean? You can't immediately, oh, well, just hold on. Hebrew dictionary, okay, uh, uh, fulfilled the function. You know, the musical instruments perform properly. Well, no. It, it's sparking in, in all sorts of different directions. Some of it is just hard to capture. Of course it's saying that it fulfills the function. Of course it's what God wanted it to be. But it's also so much more. And if you try and delimitate it in the wrong way, uh, to quote uh, uh, your theologian, Kevin Van Hooser, in another area, you'll end up catching only half the fish. And we want the whole fish, you know? So, uh, you know, I think it's multivocal. It, it includes all, all sorts of things. Like, of course, it fulfills God's, uh, God's purpose. Of course, it's affirming that it's exactly what he intended to bring into existence, but it's just so much more. I think there is an aesthetic dimension, but there's also other dimensions, just the sheer, total, visceral goodness of the whole creation, and we mustn't get away from that. Now, Sana, the Jewish commentator, hopefully, helpfully notes the polemical dimension of the approval formula. Reality is imbued with God's goodness. The pagan notion of inherent primordial evil is banished. Henceforth, evil is to be apprehended on the moral and not the mythological plane. So as is typical of these narratives, there's a very strong 
uh, a polemical dimension in relation to alternative narratives of creation. And you, you, know, you notice here, uh, then also, of course, that's in the ancient Near East, but you could say the same about the Greek and Gnosticism and various forms of you know, worldviews which have good and evil as co-eternal principles. There's none of that here. You know, there's fiat and there's gaze. And it's all tov and tov ma'ot. Now then some comments on seeing and naming. Here I'm wondering a bit, if you'll give me permission, outside of Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, transgressing the boundaries. The connection between God seeing and human seeing is picked up by Westerman, and this comes into focus in the intriguing comment after Genesis 1 in Genesis 2:19 in which God brings the animals and the birds to Adam, now listen to this, to see what he would call them. You see, this is where historical criticism has been so damaging. You know, you spend your life trying to argue that, you know, Genesis 2 and 3 is not a separate creation story. I mean, there's a gazillion ways. So, so we've got to get away from that with academic rigor and then read these narratives sequentially. So you've got this whole background of the approval formula. Now you've got Adam, and that brings the, the animals and the birds, which are tov, to Adam to see what he would call them. Part of the radicality and the goodness of creation is the relative autonomy God grants to humankind. And here we witness another kind of divine seeing as the God who has seen waits to see what Adam would name the birds and the animals. In Genesis 1, God sees and names. Here he sees how Adam sees and names. It's a very interesting theological move. At stake here, and I haven't got time to go into this, are a huge number of issues, including our understanding of dominion the role, and the role of philosophy and theology of language. Especially in postmodernism, which I think may now be in demise, language and naming is seen as inherently violent. And that is not the view here. Language and naming correctly exercised are wonderful gifts of God. They are truly tov. For Westerman, this naming marks the point where the man begins to execute his capabilities. According to Westerman, Man gives the animals their names and thereby puts them into a place in his world. Very masculine comment, <laughs> in my opinion. Let me just repeat that. Okay. You've got, uh, uh, man gives the animals their names and thereby puts them into a place in his world. In my view, there's a more complex relationality in play that leads to a much more helpful view of the naming Indeed, one that is far less anthropocentric in the unhelpful sense. Now, the spirit, I think, of naming is gloriously captured in a, a Canadian author, Harriet's experience of what, is, what awoke his interest in birds in his wonderful, wonderful book, Grass, Sky, Song. He said, the thought of creatures being endemic to the place I lived stirred something to life in my brain. I began to see that learning the names of things mattered, not so much in the possession it afforded as in its capacity to call forth things from generality into particularity that allowed for admiration, familiarity, even wonder. Ian Ramsey, the theologian, says, and I think this is much more insightful than Westerman, if the act of naming signifies anything about the name giver, it is the quality of discernment. Thus, when Ha-Adam names the animals, it is more appropriate to understand this as an act of his discerning something about these creatures, an essence which has already been established by God. Now, you know, uh, uh, I've been talking uh, to Jeffrey and others, but if you don't know about what I think is the most exciting thing going on in the philosophical world today, I really think you should, and that is Catholic French phenomenology. Uh, in my view, it is by far the most exciting thing 
in which uh, these Catholic French phenomenologists are weaving across philosophy and theology. Emmanuel Falk says of Paul Ricoeur that in his, his uh, generation, philosophers could only approach the threshold of theology. And Falk now celebrates that we can go across them. And also in the midst of their work, the most unbelievably insightful exegesis of which I want to give you an example. So Jean-Louis Chrétien has written a book on philosophy of language called The Ark of Speech, A-R-K, not A-R-C. And the reference is to Noah's Ark. Now this, by the way, is a serious academic publication. Chrétien takes the image of the ark from Noah's ark. His reflection on Adam's naming of the animals is acute and representative of his view of language as a form of hospitality. Much more essential, he says, and worthy of consideration is the fact that this story makes human speech into the first ark. The animals have been gathered for human speech and brought together in this speech, which names them long before they are brought together. In Noah's Ark, to be saved from the flood and the destruction it brings, their first guardian, their first safeguard is that of speech. And so the way Chretien reads this is that the naming of the animals, remember, God is seeing to see what animal do with this. Chrétien says this is the first big test of Adam. Will he use speech to dominate, in Westerman's terms, to place animals in his world? Or will he use speech to safeguard the integrity of the otherness of the animals that God has declared tov? So that language functions like an ark. This is just, in my opinion, exquisite stuff. Like George Steiner, real presences, Chrétien relates his view of language to creation. He says, in the account of creation given in the first chapter of Genesis, we see brought into play so that the game of the world can be played, a word and a gaze, and they are inseparable. Paul Celan was not the first to note the common root in German of denken and danken, to think and to thank. But as Chrétien notes, to think is to thank. But for this to be true, to thank must be to think really and truly. In other words, to see. Uh, I quote Chrétien. You know, I want to keep quoting Chrétien, but I will stop after this. The world itself is heavy with speech. It calls on speech on our, and on our speech in response, and it calls only by responding itself already to the speech that created it. How could such speech be foreign to the world when it subsists through faith only by the word? The speech we utter about the world does not come from beyond the world. It is no more a stranger to the world than we are. Now, naming extends far beyond naming animals. It's about the use of language. In her exquisite book, Caring for Words in a Culture of Lies, Marilyn Chandler McIntyre laments the depletion and erosion of North American English. I'm allowed to say that because I, I come from Britain now, and you can <laughs> extradite me back there tonight. She looks back to a time in the history of English when to converse was to foster community, to commune with, to dwell in a place with others. Language and naming are a central element to being fully human, through being attentive, through seeing the particularities of God's rich and diverse creation. With an amazing group of writers, Barry Lopez has edited a book called Home Ground, Language for an American Landscape, an alphabetical resource aimed at a recovery of, our, of a vocabulary for land and place. As Lopez notes in his introduction, we put a geometry to the land, back country, front range, high desert, and pick out patterns in it, pool and rifle, swale and riffle, swale and rise, basin and range. We make it remote, North 40, vivid, birdfoot delta, and humorous Detroit riprap. 
It is a language that keeps us from slipping off into abstract space. Here we begin to see just how profound, in my opinion, is the approval formula in Genesis 1. And you know, if there's one thing just from this lecture I want you to take away, you know, we haven't said the final word about the Bible. You know, uh, I'm an evangelical, card-carrying, etc., etc. But, you know, to think we are the Bible people and then we do this, uh, you know, thin exegesis without any of the rich, extraordinary overtones of Scripture for the whole of creation, this should bring us to repentance. You know, uh, Scripture has uh, so much to say in all these areas. So Genesis 1 opens out, in my opinion, into a theology and philosophy of the gaze and of the word, of perception and of language. Contra postmodernism, God's gaze and affirmation means that the world has a discernible shape. So that philosophically, if you put together let there be and kitov, philosophically you are pushed, as Mark Knoll long ago recognized, to some form of critical realism when it comes to philosophy. We do not constitute the entire world. There is a discernible shape to the world which can be known. That's in philosophy what we call realism. To allude to George Steiner, whose book Real Presences I think is must-reading, a grammar of creation, for that is what he calls for, means, contra postmodernism, that being is indeed sayable. Contemplating the creation with respect and wonder and bringing it into expression, whether in poetry or science, is one of the ways in which we as humans image God. Genesis 1 invites us through the approval formula to see the world as God does, and with him, you know, the approval formula, it's almost a pronouncement formula. And it has resonances for me with the baptism of Jesus and the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, where God pronounces. And here you've got this pronouncement over the whole creation. Tov. Ma'od tov. Now, a God's eye view. One of the things, reasons I think this is such extraordinary literature now, I don't know your view of the uh, composition of Genesis 1 to 11. If you have the authoritative view on that, you must see me afterwards because I need it. Okay? And uh, I'm very conservative on, on historical critical issues and that sort of thing, but we also have to think hard about them. Now, I, think, I, I don't think Israel only discovered a doctrine of creation late in her history. If you're living in the ancient Near East, you would have had one virtually from the beginning. But I do think Genesis 1, verse 11, is a bit like, uh, I learned this from a prof that I studied under in South Africa, is a bit like prophecy in reverse. And I find it helpful to think of Genesis 1 to 11 like that. So it's like, you know, because it telescopes an enormous amount of time in that, and it tells us truly the story but in using particularly literary, literary tropes and other things. A friend of mine says Genesis 1 to 11 is a bit like being in the midst of Israel and Israel looking over her shoulder to see where she's come from. Now, if that is true, it is written for believers who live after the fall. So that, that's why I think this is such extraordinary literature. This is important because this side of the fall it is often only by faith that we can see and affirm the goodness of the creation. Amidst the collateral damage of the fall and sin, we sometimes find ourselves in Job-like situations in which it is nigh impossible to see a world charged with the grandeur of God's glory, as Gerald Manley Hopkins so eloquently put it. Hopkins is interesting because he was, if you know his story, he was no stranger to severe depression. And yet out of that darkness, he was able to write of Christ who plays in 10,000 places. Annie Dillard, a pilgrim in Tinker's, at Tinker's Creek, is another contemplative of creation. And she wrestles in her work with the shadow side of the world. And yet do you remember how Pilgrim at Tinker Creek ends? I want to quote it again and again and again. She surfaces with a tremendous sense of God and his goodness 
And these are the final words of Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. And like Billy Bray, I go my way. And my left foot says glory. And my right foot says amen. In and out of Shadow Creek, upstream and down, exultant in a daze, dancing to the twin silver trumpets of praise. You see, in some sense, I think, the doctrine of creation implies that in some sense Leibniz was right to argue that this is the best of all possible worlds. As Bart notes, but in the order of created existence as such, there can be nothing better than what is. Bart rightly says towards the end of a nuanced interaction with Leibniz, and as followers, he must... Now, listen to this, and, and this is why I love Bart. I disagree with Bart. You don't have to love people only if you agree with them. You know, some of the people you love the most are the ones you have the biggest fights with. I love Bart. Listen to this. Leibniz must be taken seriously in dogmatics because he too, although in a very different way, tried to sing. And in his own way did in fact sing the unqualified praise of God the Creator in his relationship to the creature. Okay, now I have 10 minutes and I'm nearly there. The comprehensive dimensions of the doctrine of creation. God does not need to look to see if his handiwork is good. I hope you understand that. But he delights in doing so. And how, I ask you, my brothers and sisters, can we deny the goodness of light, earth, sky, sea, the planets, the stars, and the sun, the animals, the world, and the human and humankind? How can we deny the goodness of that if God reflects upon them and declares them kitov? There are many dimensions to the goodness of creation, and I think philosophically and theologically that could be opened up much more. It means that they perfectly fulfill God's intention. It doesn't mean that there's no room for development. One of the things with Tov and Tov Ma'ot and God resting is that the creation is poised for all the hidden potentials that are built within it to be unlocked by humankind in a development of the creation. So Tov does not mean final, finished but it does mean fundamentally good. It means that in its creaturely mode, it shares in the goodness of God. As Bart perceptively notes, creaturely goodness is the benefit of creation. You see, the goodness of creation and the comprehensiveness of creation go together. By the comprehensiveness of creation, I draw attention to the multifaceted and rich diversity of the world in which we live, including its inbuilt, inbuilt dynamic potential for development. It is in, for example, the divine speeches in the latter part of Job that we receive a very strong affirmation of the diversity of creation. In Job 38 to 42, we hear of the foundation of earth, the boundaries of the sea, its great depth and its garment, the clouds, the mysteries of light and darkness, and the newness of the dawn each morning, the varieties of weather, snow, hail, rain, lightning, wind, desert places where no human lives, the constellation of stars, the wonderful diversity of animal life, and whatever we make of them, behemoth and leviathan. If the divine speeches emphasize the so-called natural world, we should not forget the celebration of culture-making in Job 28 with its use of the metaphor of mining. By definition, do you remember the merism, heaven and earth? The doctrine of creation relates to all that is, apart from evil, which is a parasite on the good creation. And so Bart rightly notes that it is our duty, and this is what we are taught by the self-revelation of God and Jesus Christ, to love and praise the created order, because as is made manifest in Jesus Christ, it is so mysteriously well-pleasing to God. Now, evangelicalism, of which I count myself a firm adherent, in particular has been dogged 
by various forms of sacred secular dualism. And, and I, I thought, you know, I lived in England before, and I used to say uh, on some moments, I think this heresy comes from America, and we should send it back there. Now I return to England, and, and it's alive and well in Cambridge, I think. But, you know, what is the problem with evangelicalism? This is something I hope you're exploring at TED's, that there's this pervasive, deep dualism between sacred and secular. I was converted into evangelical church in South Africa amidst the hell of racistic apartheid. And that dualism prevented most evangelicals from being able to identify the problem with racism that stared us in the face every day. And do you know what it does in America? Now, of course, it's, that's a good example because the whole world could see that racism was an idol. You have your own idols. And if you are embraced in a sacred secular dichotomy, what you will do is produce Christian versions of the idols of the day. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. In South Africa, we had wonderful born-again, Bible-believing, evangelistic, missional, racist Christians. That's possible, because I have seen it with my own eyes. And so a manifestation of this vocational pyramid with the most spiritual vocations being those dealt dealing with the soul, namely pastors and missionaries. So this is what I was converted into. If you wanted to follow Christ fully, the only place was the seminary. And then fully, fully was the mission field, and less fully was the pastorate. And then, you know, the feeding chain just deteriorated. Businessmen were okay. I mean, it's a filthy world, but they, they tithe nicely. <laughs> so we want them. Then right at the bottom, I mean, the artists, my goodness me. They're always asking for money. They barely eke out an existence. And what do they do? They sit and think. And they produce these funny things. Sometimes they help with the church bulletin. Now, that's redemptive. <laughs> See, this is the sacred... But it's so pervasive. And it is a, a, a stench, I think, in the nostrils of God. And it prevents... It, it absolutely hamstrings the witness of the church. And it prevents us from ever being able to say with God of his creation, Quito. That's what's at stake in this. And here is where I started in our return there. We witnessed the re-emergence of a Neoplatonism which the doctrine of creation utterly resists. As Eugene Peterson so wonderfully notes, if we are Christians, we are all in holy orders. There is no such thing as a part-time servant of the Lord Christ. We referred above to Genesis 2.19. Here is in Genesis, this is a final comment on redemption. So how does redemption relate to creation? Some of you will be asking. Well, that's an important question. Because uh, we referred above to Genesis 2.19. Here is in Genesis 2-3. Apart from, intriguingly, in the mouth of the serpent, who only refers to Elohim when he speaks, uh, the narrator uses the very unusual name Yahweh Elohim. This is pregnant theologically. A reminder it is, because where do you go for the theology of Yahweh? Exodus 3 and Exodus 6, right? This great redeemer God who rescues his people from slavery in Egypt, and in the words of Exodus 19, brings you to myself. That is Yahweh. Why juxtapose in Genesis 2 and 3 Yahweh with Elohim? It is a reminder that the covenantal relational Yahweh who rescues his people and brings them to himself is the creator Elohim. This is of vital doctrines for our doctrine of, of redemption. As evangelicals, we are in such haste to get to the cross and the resurrection, which I fully understand that we bypass the doctrine of creation and that we thereby end up with a diminished doctrine of the person and work of Christ. As one author has put it, creation is the very stuff of redemption. With the biblical meta-narrative moving from the great park of Eden to the new heavens and the new earth. As we retrieve the doctrine of sanctification, Part of Genesis 1's 3's discipline of us 
is to remind us that there are different ways of seeing, different ways of judging the good. Neither we nor our world are God, but our world is his footstool. And we are part of that footstool, and thus worthy of attention, care, wonder, and contemplation. And so I close with an extract from a medieval theologian, Bonaventura, that I, I, I do enjoy. I mean, this really lays it on the line, so you better tighten your seatbelts. Whoever, therefore, is not enlightened by such splendor of created things is blind. Whoever is not awakened by such outcries is deaf. Whoever does not praise God because of all these effects is dumb. Whoever does not discover the first principle from such clear signs is a fool. Therefore, open your eyes, alert the ears of your spirit, open your lips and apply your heart so that in all creatures you may see, hear, praise, love, and worship, glorify and honor your God, lest the whole world rise against you. For because of this, the whole world will fight against the foolish. On the contrary, it will be a matter of glory for the wise who can say with the prophet, you have gladdened me, Lord, by your deeds, and in the works of your hands I will rejoice. How great are your works, Lord. You have made all things in wisdom. The earth is filled with your creatures. Amen. Thank you. We have time for questions. Um, we also have two microphones set up. If you can make your way to these microphones, uh, we'll open the floor for questions. I guess I can begin with a question uh, while you're coming. Um, appreciate this very much. We do sometimes um, have faced these tendencies to, as it were, to devalue creation. Sometimes it seems, though, that there can be a, a tendency to go the other direction as well. Um, but, so let me put, to, put, I'll put it to you this way. Is there any significance, and if so, what might it be to the use of tov here rather than tamim? In other words, creation is said repeatedly and forcefully and powerfully to be good, but not in Genesis 1 to be perfect. Mm, mm. Uh. Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I would love to, so I think you, you probably have views on this. So I think uh, uh, the, the, one of the ways to get at this would be, you'd have to ask what does good mean and what does perfect mean? Okay, and of course words have meanings in particular contexts. So if the, the use of tov rather than tamim uh, if that means that creation is less than good, then I think no. There's no significance in that. And then, uh, uh, you know, the, the biblical scholars could help us here. Yeah, the uses of tamim in uh, uh, the rest of the Old Testament. So the notion of perfection uh, is a very interesting one. So what I've tried to argue here is that tov part of the goodness of creation is that it's open to development towards a telos. So, so I think goodness doesn't mean that this is the, the final, final product. But I'm very interested to know if one is saying that tov is used rather than tamim, there's something going on here. What, what is going on? I, I, don't, I don't know. You know yeah. can, I, can I just follow on on exactly mm. that? issue. Mm. Um, I believe it was Fretheim who did make that distinction mm. in order to allow for the possibility of death amongst animals, the mm. animal creation, mm. uh, within the general mm. framework of Genesis 1. Mm. And of course that fits into whether one holds to a long, yeah. uh, or an old earth creation or young earth. So that I think is the background possibly to your question mm. there. This distinction between a world that can be created good 
but not necessarily perfect in the sense that there's no element of death whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. So, so that's illuminating. And uh, so a quick response. Uh, in the doctrine of creation that my colleague and I have been writing, we've deliberately not let science set the agenda. So, you know, almost uh, everything that I see on creation nowadays is about the creation science dialogue. And then I, I think very, my fear about that philosophically is that you end up in a, trying to correlate. And what you concede are the epistemological foundations of modern science. I'm not willing to concede that. So my approach is now not that these questions are unimportant. I think the scientific questions are very important. But what has helped me a lot is to try and ask questions like, what would Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 have meant to Israelites? Now, it's very unlikely, in my opinion, that they were, even on their radar screen, was the issue of animal death. Maybe. I mean, ancient Eastern scholars could help you, but I don't think so. So I think Genesis, you know, we have to read it. It obviously had huge meaning to, to the early Israelites who, who heard this creation narrative. And then I think when we've listened to that, we can then ask, how does Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 address our 21st century scientific questions? That's my strategy, which is a bit of a cop-out. I get it. But, uh, so I don't know the answer to animal death. I'm just not sure that Genesis is trying to address that. So then to argue that Tov is used deliberately to create space for that, it, it sounds to me too much like letting 21st century questions set the agenda and I'm reluctant to do that. Taylor, thank you for that rich and wonderful, and I would say even pastoral lecture. I uh, I want to draw out some implications. You said um, that God does not need to see in order to to approve mm. the creation, and I say a hearty amen. But of course. Uh, that's not so with us. So I, I want to think about uh, our, our gaze, the gaze of humans um, on the creation. And I'm reminded of, um, of a little book by uh, a scholar named Elaine, K Elaine Scarry uh, on beauty and being just. Oh. She teaches at Harvard. It's a book she uses with first year students there. And I've used it with my students in the past. So if you'll permit me, Permit me a, a bit of summary. So the, it's just two essays mm. on, on beauty and being wrong and on beauty and being fair. And so instead of giving an, like an account of beauty, she's giving a kind of phenomenology of the experience of beauty. Mm. And um, in the second essay, she pushes back on uh, the, the, the political criticism that the gaze always objectifies and, mm. and returns to classical notions of a beautiful object or person mm. actually have any power over mm. the one gazing at it. Mm. So, so here she tries to establish the ethical relations mm. between the, the viewer and mm. the thing mm. viewed. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how they're connected. I don't know if one comes first mm. um, before the other. But in the first essay, she talks about uh, what's just called On Beauty and Being Wrong the experience of having seen something and not perceived its beauty, right? Or, or overvalued the beauty mm. of something. Mm. And mm. so there she's, she's kind of um, mm. arguing for a kind of epistemological humility. So I wonder, uh, just to get mm. your thoughts on that, to what degree does, is our gaze um, dependent upon an epistemological humility that we've seen creation for what it is mm. and assessed it rightly and how is that connected to our ethical relation to it? That if we behold it as beautiful, we then have a responsibility to care for it. Mm. Okay. Well, well, thank you. So I haven't read Scary's book, but I've taken notes. So that's what I love. I go home with a book list, and, and it's growing. So uh, there's always so much more to learn. So, you know, just a big, big area. So just first of all, I think one thing Genesis 1 is saying to us is that there's a way of seeing that is normative. 
Okay. So, so you know, so this is the, the, I hear overtones of the postmodern sort of uh, 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 thing that, you know, to name or to see is inherently violent. And, and that is just a, a massive mistake. Okay, so what, what I've found, just a heuristic device, if any of you have read Al Walter's book, Creation Regained, he makes the distinction between structure and direction. And it's a heuristic device that is just hugely useful. So speech is a good structure of the creation, but it can, in a fallen, broken world, be misdirected. So, you know, there is the gaze, and this is a psychologist friend taught me this at uh, the uh, university college I taught at in Canada, what we don't want as humans, and what I don't want, is to be acclaimed. What I do long for is to be seen for who I am. There, there's a seeing that is just exquisite. It's the recognition. This is why Levinas, I think, is onto something when he grounds ethics in the face of the other. So, so you know, that's where postmodernism, I think, is dreadfully unhelpful. Now, there's also the gaze of the voyeur. That's the misdirected gaze. But the response to misdirection is not to say the gaze is irretrievably broken. It's to recover the gaze. You know, and, and the, the, these are just extraordinarily uh, beautiful and human things. The other thing just which I would need to think about a lot more, uh, I think there's an overemphasis on beauty and this goes back to you know, Greek philosophy, the true, the good, and the beautiful. So somehow we think that something is only good if it's beautiful. But, and so my friend Calvin Seerfeld, an aesthetician, he has argued that the heart of aesthetics is not beauty but elusivity, that things are elusive. And so you know, it, it means, if I can use play with language, sometimes that which is very ugly can be very, very beautiful. So, so I think I'm a bit wary of just where we go with this Greek tradition of beauty. Yeah. Now, I'd love the students to ask some questions. But <laughs> no, 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 Mark, Mark, go for it. <laughs> but I do want to know what the students are thinking. I'd love to. Yeah. I'm curious if you can use what you said there at the end to go back to the question that came up earlier about the question of animal death, because mm. um, I was musing on that as well, if kind of what you're doing with Tove is to try to press us mm. to be able to look at creation mm. and with God be able to say, yes, that is Tove, mm. that is good. What do we do about the things in creation that we look at that are really difficult for us to describe using the language of goodness and beauty? Mm. Um, mm. And, and I, here I want to get more specific, not just animal death, but at least what looks to us in creation like purposeless suffering. Mm. Um, so an animal dying, not yeah. just for the sake of nourishing some other animal, no, no, no. but, yeah, but suffering know. in a way that doesn't seem to have any purpose to it, that's really difficult for me to look at and yeah, declare yeah, tobe yeah. or yeah. beauty in that. Yeah, yeah. Your first response made me a little bit nervous, because if I just go to, well, that's not what they had in mind uh, when, no, when they were no, writing no. Genesis 1, right? That no, seems to retract the tobe yeah, claim yeah. in ways that I think yeah, you would be yeah, unhappy yeah, with. So yeah, yeah. then as you were talking about beauty and ugliness at the mm, end. I was wondering mm. if you might resource that to respond to those concerns or if you would go in a yeah, different direction. Oh my goodness, okay. I think I want to hear from the students. <laughs> 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 yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, so, you know, so I'm just going to make a few initial comments and uh, I do, the scientific questions are tremendously important. Uh, what I've been concentrating on is uh, a, a constructive doctrine of creation first and then to have a look at science. And the way theory construction develops in science is not neutral. So there's all sorts of things there. But so one of the things, Mark, that, which I tried to draw attention to, which is so amazing to me, I mean, you know, being an Israelite was not always easy. Like, A, they, they were pretty bad. They got beaten up. They were at the center of forces of empire that would stomp all over them and do all sorts of things. But I think it's out of the midst of that experience comes Genesis 1 looking back over their shoulders. That, that to me is almost miraculous. So Genesis 1, I think, is a text for post-fallen creatures. You know, so that I find so amazing that there is a way, and that's where I think uh, Annie Dillard, you know, the spending time, I mean, this, she reflects on all this stuff and Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, the strangeness of what animals do and animal behavior, and yet she ends up in a place like Genesis 1. So I find that very interesting. 
I, I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, the, the question of animal death, uh, I mean, uh, all this stuff, of course, is on the table now in theodicy and notions of divine discourse uh, and all that sort of thing. Uh, and there are different view, views on, the, on this matter. So, uh, and certainly it's possible that uh, there is a type of animal death that could be included under goodness. Some would argue there's a type of human dying. I mean, I think that's a bit more problematic theologically. But, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, that's kind of the beauty and the ugliness thing is just, uh, it, it's not to make... Uh, uh, you see, I, I just don't know what we mean or what I mean when I use the word beauty. And so Seafeld has, has, in his aesthetics, he has moved away from the Western Greek tradition, which makes beauty the sort of apex of the aesthetic, rather arguing that the aesthetic is about allusivity, and it then brings in the possibility of that which is ugly being aesthetically very good. But I wouldn't quickly move that towards... Uh, you know, and we're living in such interesting times, so I'm fascinated by the work being done now on the emotional lives of animals. You know, we're finding out that animals are sentient creatures in a way that we hadn't imagined possible. So I think the issue of animal pain is very important to me and, uh, and how one fits that together. So uh, part of my response to Mark's very good questions would be, I learned a long time ago, you know, in my early days as an evangelical and believing in the inerrancy of the Bible, it felt like I lived in a house of cards. And if one card went, the whole thing. So it led regularly to major panics. And then it was John Wenham who helped me in his book, Easter Enigma, I think it was. On a lot of these things, I don't, we don't know the answers. So you wait. And you work. And you think and you pray. And you wait and you work and you think and you pray. Some of them, I think, we just will have to live for the time being saying, there is an apparent contradiction here, and we will live with that contradiction. So, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that really helpful lecture. Um, in Genesis 1-2, the words tohu vavohu mm -hmm. are often translated formless and void, and mm -hmm. you mentioned Wenham's commentary. He paraphrases that as a gaping abyss. Mm -hmm. Is there any space for seeing, in your view, the goodness of Genesis 1 as a goodness that's sort of set over and against this, this dark chaos okay, that is yeah, at the yeah. beginning? And the reason it's, it comes up in connection to these other questions yeah. is that amazing quote from Annie Dillard that you quoted mm. comes at the end of this book where she's going mm. on and on about the brutality. Mm. So it's a sort of statement of goodness mm. over and against the recognition mm. of mm. chaos. Okay. Do you see any, po any room for yeah. that in Genesis 1? So I want to quote Karl Barth on this, and the answer is nine. <laughs> no, but, and the reason I say that is Barth argued for this view, that what Genesis 1 and 2 about is the shadow side of creation, which is the, the risk God takes in creating, and it's the threat that always hangs over creation, the darkness, the abyss. Uh, so, you know, if you, and the reason I, I say nine is I have a, a chapter coming out on a book uh, that was a lecture given at uh, Trinity Western University on uh, a theological interpretation and Genesis 1 verse 2, in which I compare Barth's reading with Bonhoeffer's reading, and I think Bonhoeffer is the better, more biblical reading. So, so I don't, uh, and, and amongst some ancient Near Eastern scholars, that whole thing comes from Gunkel, who found, you know, that uh, Genesis 1 verse 2, I think Bart has this quote that Genesis 1 verse 2 is a treasure chest of mythological <laughs> elements. So, uh, and I, it's, there's now, amongst some ancient Near Eastern scholars, a Skurlock, Joanna Skurlock comes to mind, who is saying it's not even in view there. So, but I, I do not think, I think much more the formless and void is the, it's the initial stage of creation. So I think it's the first step, if you like, in creation. So I don't think darkness and those are bad things. I think darkness is a good thing. 
and uh, and then what, what you have is the the stage by stage the formation of the world as we know it and then of course in, in, in other parts of scripture job 3 and in other places decreation is the kind of move back to that initial stage but i don't think see bart ends up saying and the spirit hovered over the waters. You know, Bart has to, he, he says this is the Holy Spirit, but he has to immediately marginalize that this is not the word. So, so, so I, I think no, but that's my view. But it is a contested text, yeah. Thank you for your insight on the semantics of Tov. I really enjoyed that. I wondered whether you had any comment or idea about how your idea about seeing in Genesis 1, God seeing the creation is good, relates to Genesis 3 when Eve says that the tree is good for food, like she sees that it's good for food. It almost feels like she's going almost as far as God is going in affirming the goodness of the tree, then she misinterprets the function. Mm. So that the goodness of seeing has an ethical dimension, but mm. maybe you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, no, well, thank you. So, see, this is where I think theological interpretation should be all over this stuff. And what, I, what I'm trying to do in this lecture is to say to you, a feast awaits. Are we eating at this feast? I, I think it's a feast that awaits. So, you know, th th there's so, so many interesting things. So, and this is structure and direction. God sees. And the text, I think, is inviting us to see the world the way God sees it, amidst the brokenness and the collateral damage of the fall, so that with Annie Dillard, we can rise up amidst the struggle and say, Kito. Okay, now, what happens with the dialogue between the serpents? Now, this is literature. It's not straightforward historical narrative. You know, the last time I uh, saw a, a speaking snake, I'd been smoking, no, I'm sorry, I hadn't been. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? If someone comes and says, you know, there's a massive snake outside there, and do you know what it told me? I mean, we would say, no, just hold on. We just have to make a phone call. You know, but uh, uh, so, so this is, now I'm not saying it's not the, you know, I think the rest of Scripture tells us this is uh, Hashatan, this is the devil, but there's nothing in the text that says that. It's a speaking snake. And then what it does, and I think this is where it's so interesting, it uh, evokes the imagination of Eve in such a way that she sees in a way she hadn't seen before. But I think what you're absolutely right. Now, and this is very subtle, because the beauty which is there, it, you know, becomes twisted. It's, it's very desirable. So, and this is where, you know, for example, uh, in the debates about homosexuality and that kind of thing, we're often so simplistic. So Augustine describes homosexual desire as disordered love. It doesn't mean it's not love. It's disordered. And so there's a seeing which is disordered with catastrophic consequences. But it's always connected to what's actually there. I mean, it's not that Eva seeing is, is smoked something and is imagining it. It's there, but she's seeing it in a way that is distorted, I think. Yeah. Thank you. The danger of hogging the floor <laughs> here. Thank, I want to thank you as well for a very stimulating lecture. Thank you. Um, can you help us understand how we're to see and understand the creation right now? There seems to be a tension running through Scripture. We have... The opening chapters, Genesis, the creation is very good, mm. and, and yet there's the reality of Adam's disobedience, mm. and it seems to have a cosmic effect, mm. Mm. which presumably lasts on to the present. Mm. And we see this tension reflected in Scripture, where the heavens declare the, the glory of God, mm. the firmament proclaims his handiwork, mm. and yet Paul can also speak about the whole creation groaning. Mm. Mm. So there seems to be some yeah, tension yeah, there. Yeah, can yeah, you help yeah. us understand how we're to see <laughs> Script, uh, creation right now? Well, I think you've just helped us, you know, so much. So there, there's, uh, I mean, there's, there's this multiple metaphors going on. I, I think, uh, but to refer back to the earlier thing, I do think that's what Genesis 1 is there for. It's Israel in the midst of the struggle to be Yahweh's people looking over her shoulder uh, to where she came from. 
So this is not, I don't think Genesis 1 was written pre-fall. Okay, this is, a, you know, this is literature that emerges in the midst of history, but prophetically looks back. And so it's a, an encouragement, I think, in the midst of the groan and the agony and the, what the heck is going on and where is God to find our way to the point where we too are able to say kitov about the whole of the creation. So, and the other thing which I, I ended with is the, and this I would appeal to, you know, let me ask you this question. Uh, uh, why, what is God trying to do in salvation? And, uh, you know, uh, 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 let me just put two questions. I would often say to my students, quoting the art historian Hans Ruckmarker, why does God save us? And they would always come up with the good evangelical answers to go to heaven because he loves us, etc. Do you know what Ruckmarker's answer is? Which I think is euangelion in the true sense of the word. God saves us to make us fully human. Now that, I think, is good news. That's your doctrine of creation. So, you know, so it's groaning, it's broken. Uh, you know, Karl Barth is uh, uh, 50, 60 years ahead of his time talking about animal rights and how slaughterhouses should have a verse from Romans written over them. And, you know, so, uh, and it's not just that the creation is broken, it's that the creation is broken to a large extent because we break it again and again and again. You know, we, it's Chesterton, what's wrong with the world? I am. I mean, this is a very poignant insight. So one of the things I think we have to recover is that, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Of course, individual salvation is very much part of that. But when you become a Christian, you're invited to accompany God in the Missio Dei, which is a recovery of God's purposes for the whole of creation. And so this is why Genesis 1 is so important. In the midst of being Israel, surrounded by all these dreadful nations, you've got to find a way of saying of the whole of the creation, Kitov, so that redemption is the recovery of God's purposes for creation and leading it towards the goal for which God always intended. And then built into that, I would build in notions of common grace and so on that hold back uh, the, the possibilities of, of uh, extraordinary evil and so on and so forth. But thank you. Great question. Right. Thank you, all of you. We really appreciate this. Will you join me in thanking uh, Dr. Bartholomew? <laughs>